When I think of Chuck E. Cheese, I think of children playing arcade games, overpriced prizes, weird animatronics, and mediocre pizza. Regardless, I'm sure many families made great memories at Chuck E. Cheese throughout the 90s. As you can tell from the title of the video, this incident was not one of those. On the night of December 14th, 1993, a Chuck E. Cheese in Aurora, Colorado was closing and the customers were shuffling out of the building. Unbeknownst to the employees inside, a sinister plan was about to unfold inside the restaurant. The source of these plans was sitting in the restaurant bathroom mere meters away from them as they began their usual cleanup routine before locking up. Before we get into the awful events of that December night, we need to go back in time and look into the perpetrator's past. Nathan Dunlap was born April 8, 1974 and was raised by his adoptive father Jerry Dunlap and biological mother Carol Dunlap. Dunlap never met his biological father, later discovered to be a man named Jerome Lang, who Carol had a brief affair with before meeting Jerry. Before we go any further, none of the things I'm about to talk about excuse anything this guy did. What he did was reprehensible and inexcusable. Having said that, the following does provide context. While growing up, Dunlap did not have a stable home life. The family, consisting of Nathan, his older sister Adenia, his younger brother Garland, and his two parents moved between Chicago, Illinois, Memphis, Tennessee, Michigan, then finally to Colorado in 1984. During this time, Dunlap's mother Carol struggled with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, with the latter disorder plaguing the family for many generations before Nathan was even born. Carol's mental illness was significant. Carol was said to often yell at Nathan Nathan and his siblings, even if there wasn't a reason for doing so. Carol's former neighbors would later say under oath that she was physically violent toward the children. As the years went on, Carol's manic episodes progressed rapidly. She would stop eating and sleeping altogether. In the late hours of the night, she would randomly awaken and rearrange every piece of furniture in the house. She had phases where she would become extremely religious for short bursts, even joining a cult at one point. It was also later stated by family members that she would sporadically become hypersexual, leading to her touching Nathan and Garland inappropriately. She even tried to take Garland's life at one point, claiming he was possessed by the devil. In 1987, due to her many manic episodes, doctors began treating her with lithium, which was said to have stabilized Carol's mental health. Jerry Dunlap, Nathan's adoptive father, was said to physically abuse the children and would hit them with belts, wooden rods, and his fists for minor infractions. He would often throw Nathan down the hall and into walls out of anger. Understandably, Nathan's sister Adenia called their home a living hell due to these circumstances. Nathan Dunlap had severe mental struggles in his junior high years, attempting suicide at least twice. Around this time, Jerry Dunlap had him evaluated by the psychologist at Overland High School. Testing revealed signs of hypomania. By the DSM-5 definition, hypomania typically doesn't severely impair an individual's ability to do daily activities. Signs include a decreased need for sleep, overall increase in energy, and unusual behavior in general. Accounts from Nathan's friends described him as agitated and energetic. When Nathan was 15, he discovered discovered that Jerry was not his biological father, although it's not stated if this had an adverse effect on him or not. Unfortunately, by the time Nathan was 15 years old, he had already committed multiple robberies. The first documented robbery Dunlap committed was at a dry cleaners where Nathan robbed an individual while threatening them with a golf club. Nathan would quickly take to using handguns during these robberies. A pizzeria, a Burger King, and other restaurants would all be targets during these crimes. These crimes eventually caught up with Nathan and he would find himself in juvenile court. The court decided to give him an opportunity to turn his life around due to his young age and the fact that nobody had been physically harmed during the robberies. He was then placed in several youth facilities. At one facility, St. Joseph's, his odd behavior led to his hospitalization. While there, a mental health professional expressed concern that Nathan may have had an emerging thought disorder. It's around this time the family started going to counseling sessions during Nathan's rehabilitative process. Carol actively disrupted the rehabilitation process by terminating family counseling, stating that she wanted to avoid giving away the family secrets. It's speculated that this paranoia and abrupt termination of the family counseling was due to Carol not wanting the physical and sexual abuse of her children coming to light. You see, there was much more going on than previously mentioned. When Nathan was 15, he walked down to the basement to find Jerry assaulting his sister. This had been going on for nearly a decade before being discovered by Nathan. After discovering Jerry's beyond horrific actions, the beatings got worse to keep Nathan quiet. On one occasion, Jerry even showed up at the Burger King Nathan worked at and inflicted a severe beating on him inside the restaurant bathroom. These events were even confirmed by Jerry, who admitted the abuse to investigators, even confirming events of abuse.
abuse that Carol engaged in with the children. While undergoing this abuse doesn't excuse Nathan's actions, it does give us important context and a big piece of the puzzle. Nathan's behavior would only get worse due to his mental condition and horrendous home life. He started hanging out more often with gang members, dealing drugs, and he continued robbing various businesses in the Aurora area. At 19 years old, Nathan got a job at Chuck E. Cheese as a cook in May 1993. He only ended up staying at this job for around one month or so as he was fired due to a heated argument with his supervisor. The root of this argument was the supervisor needing Nathan to work extra hours and Nathan refusing to. As a result of his firing, Dunlap was angry and felt that he had been made a fool of by the supervisor. In the coming months leading up to December, Nathan would frequently come by the restaurant to wander around, play arcade games, and talk to ex-coworkers. While talking to a former co-worker, Nathan said he planned to get even and briefly mentioned robbing Chuck E. Cheese and killing his former supervisor to them. In late summer, while playing basketball with friends, Dunlap mentioned that he decided he was going to go to the Chuck E. Cheese, kill them all, and take the money. On the night of December 14th, Dunlap entered the restaurant at around 9 p.m. where he ordered a ham and cheese sandwich and started playing arcade games. At around 9.50 p.m., just 10 minutes prior to closing, Nathan hid in the nearby restroom and waited. At 10 p.m., a children's birthday party had just wrapped up and the last of the customers were walking out of the building. The crew of five employees then closed the building and commence their cleanup duties. Just five minutes later at 10.05 p.m. Dunlap emerged from the bathroom with a 25 caliber semi-automatic pistol and began looking for employees. The first he saw was 19-year-old Sylvia Crowell, who was busy cleaning the salad bar. Dunlap approached her and shot her in the right ear at close range, mortally wounding her. Across the restaurant, Dunlap saw Ben Grant, who was vacuuming and may have not heard the first gunshot. Ben was fatally shot through the right eye. Another nearby employee, 17-year-old Colleen O'Connor, saw this and dropped to her knees and began pleading for her life. Dunlap approached her and fatally shot her once through the top of the head, killing her. Around the back side of the restaurant, 20-year-old Bobby Stevens was taking a smoke break. He heard pops from inside the restaurant, but brushed it off as children loudly popping balloons. A few minutes later, he finished his cigarette and re-entered the restaurant and began loading dirty utensils and dirty dishes into the dishwasher. Dunlap entered through a kitchen door and shot Bobby in the jaw. Bobby, thinking quickly in the moment, dropped to the ground and played dead. While Bobby was still on the floor, Dunlap turned his attention to 50-year-old Marge Kohlberg, the store manager. He ordered her to open the restaurant safe. After it was opened, he shot her through the ear. He then shot her a second time after noticing she was still moving, ending her life. To be clear, Marge was not the manager that fired Nathan Dunlap, as that manager was not working on this specific night. Dunlap then took Marge's purse and dumped the contents out all over her body. Then, he filled the now empty purse with $1,591 in cash from the safe, Chuck E. Cheese tokens, and Chuck E. Cheese keychains. As a side note, I'm not sure what Dunlap sought to accomplish by looting the tokens and keychains. Was he going to hang around elementary schools and have the kids trade their lunch money for the tokens? I'm not sure. While Nathan was looting the safe, Bobby Stevens had gotten up and escaped out of the back door of the restaurant. He ran to a nearby apartment complex and pounded on doors to alert people about the shooting that had just taken place. Police were then called to the scene. Due to Nathan being a former employee of the establishment, he was quickly identified. He was tracked down to his mother's apartment 12 hours later and arrested. Dunlap then took police to a gym bag located outside of his mother's home that contained a semi-automatic handgun, six rounds of ammunition, and a pair of gloves. The deceased victims were 19-year-old Sylvia Crowell, 17-year-old Ben Grant, 17-year-old Colleen O'Connor, and 50-year-old Marge Colbert. Bobby Stevens, who was shot in the jaw, had made it to the hospital in fair condition and was treated for his injury. Sylvia had also made it to the hospital, but her injuries were too much to overcome and she died the following day. Most of the victims were just about to start their adult years of life. These victims were attacked when they had nothing to do with the reasons Nathan was so angry in the first place. Whether that be his mental struggles, the abuse at the hands of his parents, or the firing from the job, the victims had nothing to do with any of these factors. In the 1996 legal proceedings following this tragedy, Dunlap was found guilty of four counts of first-degree murder, attempted murder, and robbery. Dunlap was sentenced to death plus 108 years. During the sentencing, Dunlap had an infamous angry outburst that lasted three minutes of him ranting and cussing. During the rant, Dunlap targeted the victim's families and stated, I don't give a fuck about you, your mother, or your whole family. He also added, kill me right now. You can take me to the motherfucking chair and do what the fuck 
you want. In 2008, Dunlap tried to file a petition stating that his trial attorney was ineffective by not using his mental health history and child abuse as a defense for his actions. In August of 2010, this appeal was denied. In 2012, Dunlap tried to appeal the death sentence and was rejected. Following the denied appeal, Judge William Sylvester announced Dunlap's execution date to be in mid-August 2013. Toward the end of May of that year, then-Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper granted Nathan Dunlap what's known as a temporary reprieve from the death penalty. This meant that as long as Hickenlooper was governor, Dunlap would not be executed more than likely. In November of 2018, a new governor took over, Jared Polis. He sought to repeal the death penalty entirely during his campaign and signed a bill doing so on March 23, 2020. There were three men on death row in Colorado at the time, with Dunlap being one of them. All of these sentences were changed to life without parole. That's about all I have for you guys. If you enjoyed the video and want to see more true crime cases weekly, you know what to do. Thanks guys. I'm Jeremy the Crime Historian, checking out.